the work from home shift has revolutionized IT departments more than any invention ever could. When closets became offices and commutes morphed into strolls around the neighborhood, corporate IT was left scrambling. Many companies were ill-prepared to support remote workers and this shift exposed security vulnerabilities. To the level that this pandemic made everybody go, right, at home immediately created tons of risk around how you're gonna support traditional hoteling that was out there and remote workers and remote security. It changed the dynamic tremendously. While that dynamic has been changing for a while, it was accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. On this episode of IT Visionaries, we sat down with Bob Venero, president and CEO of Future Tech Enterprises, a global solutions provider that works closely with the Fortune 500. Bob explains why companies have shifted to a philosophy of bringing your own devices are actually opening themselves up to a bevy of productivity and security challenges. He also dives into the level of security challenges the pandemic has caused and how his company's aiding those enterprises through this big pivot. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Innovate fast, empower every employee, and scale with confidence from anywhere with a customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have president and CEO of Future Tech Enterprise, Bob Venero. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. All right, right out the gate. What is Future Tech Enterprise and what do you do? So Future Tech Enterprise is a global solution provider. We work in providing technology solutions for some of the top corporations globally, focusing in the Fortune 100, Fortune 500 space. Uh, and we also play in the uh, government uh, and education space as well. And specifically, what type of services do you provide? Because the world of solutions is endless. Yeah. yeah. And uh, curious if you have like specialties, back end, data infrastructure. Give us an idea of what you guys specialize in. So, you know, it's, it's a great question. We have the full gamut, right? Everywhere from the ink and the, uh, the toner in a printer all the way up to building complex data centers and all the infrastructure and then kind of everything in between. You know, the better question I always ask ourselves is, you know, instead of our specialties, you know, where are our successes? And we have some great successes around infrastructure, infrastructure support, design, build, cybersecurity, hardware, software, logistics, a lot of great successes in those areas uh, throughout the company um, and globally. You know, one of the things that's really interesting about the company, I was doing a little homework on it, and it looks like the company's been around for more than two decades. Is that accurate? 26 years, yeah, from the basement of my uh, house to uh, where we are today, yeah. So one of the unique things about this industry, or you, I'll say you specifically, is you know, the tech industry is one of the ones that moves super fast where people kind of build things up and they flip them or they get out, exit, and they jump around. It's not very often where we have people that have built something over decades and are still involved in the organization. And so from that perspective, I'd love to hear more from you on that. And as well as, you know, we'll take you up, we'll take our listeners up to the modern day things that you're working on, but take us back to that day, that day when you're like, Hey, I'm going to start future tech enterprise. And take us back to like, what was in your mindset? What was your background prior to that? How did you get started? Yeah, I, actually my first position in the IT world was at CompUSA corporate sales. Uh, and that's kind of how I started it. And uh, that was local on Long Island. And then I moved to a company in Manhattan and uh, a company called Key Systems Microage. And I was there for probably a year and a half, maybe two years and realized that I didn't want to do the commute anymore. And I thought that I could do a better job in supporting the customers, you know, myself as an organization. And, you know, I had one of those aha moments that said, hey, no risk, no reward. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not going to make it if I don't try. And uh, I talked to the missus at the time. We said, let's go for it. And, uh, and that was the, the birth of Future Tech, you know, and that was early 1996. And when you first got started, you couldn't have possibly, op or maybe you did operate this gamut of services. What, was there an area you focused on? And if so, how did you, how did you pick it? You know, back then, right, so 96, you actually had to have a value add to be a value added supplier, right, which is very different, you know, than today. So uh, we cut our teeth on um, a proprietary 3270 emulation board that helped customers in connecting their IBM systems into 
you know, other types of systems. And, and that's kind of how the start was. And, and it was really a hardware focused organization at the very beginning, right? Because it was myself and uh, one other guy who's still with me today after 26 years. So hard, I mean, a hardware focused system or service, that's very different than today where everyone's going to just services, right? Cloud services. Most people want that, or maybe I should, I'm speaking for myself. From what I understand, a lot of companies, you know, of course, they're not as interested in investing in equipment on-prem. They're more interested in investing in cloud services. Talk about how you've seen that transition or in your perspective, are you still seeing quite a bit of customers invest in, they want their own infrastructure stacks, they're going to build their own systems and they're not quite ready to move to the cloud? You know, it, look, it's a great, great question and a great dilemma, right, for, for the world and the corporations that are out there. And we've lived the gamut, right? Everybody, you know, cloud to me was a mainframe just with a color screen, right? <laughs> so you've had that, that type of concept, you know, for years and years and years, and now it's just somebody else's cloud, right? Or somebody else's mainframe, if you even you know, want to call it that. But, you know, what we've seen over the years is, yeah, definitely a, a shift in the way that organizations are looking at utilizing infrastructure and technology. And cloud has enabled a lot of interesting opportunities for corporations. But I will tell you that, you know, we, we still do and will continue to do a tremendous amount of hardware, right? Tens and tens of millions of dollars in hardware, probably, you know, well over a hundred million plus in, in hardware alone as an organization. And that really doesn't going to go anywhere. I think it's changed right? Because of the cloud, right? And whether you're buying from Google or Amazon, right? AWS or all these other smaller organizations, right? You're, you're seeing that shift there. But with that shift comes risk. And I'm sure that's something we'll talk about, you know, as we, we go a little bit more into this, uh, into this podcast. But a lot of organizations are really now focusing on a hybrid approach versus strictly public cloud, right? And they're doing that to support the risk factors of, you know, an always connected world, which as we all know, and we've experienced the outages, yep. right? Whether it's on our phone or our internet at home or power, whatever the case may be, if a business is solely run in the cloud, right? And something happens to that connectivity, then the organization basically stops and shuts down. And can you afford to do that really is the question. So it's a great question and we could spend days you know, discussing uh, and going on, but we're, we really believe in a hybrid approach, you know, on-prem and off-prem. Off-prem for those load sets and those applications that are low risk, right? That can't put your company out of business and identifying a cost associated with what that application downtime means, Yeah, right? Because if it's a hundred bucks a day, cool, throw it in the cloud. <laughs> if it's a million dollars a minute, you better have that stuff in your environment that you can control but the right infrastructure. You know, you mentioned that, but I do remember, and you will see them every now and then when, you know, like for example, an AWS outage or an Azure outage, and you'll see people complaining like, oh, I can't game, I can't stream, right? Netflix will go down. What's interesting about those events is those are, I would consider non-critical. You know what I mean? Like at Netflix, you pay, I don't know what the fee is now, like $15 a month for unlimited access to content that they have. Yep. You know, if it's down for a day, like what are they going to do? Reimburse you 50 cents and be like, hey, here's your... <laughs> Here's your day's worth of value, right? Or yeah, they're not yeah. even going to do that really. Yeah. But to your point, it's not a mission critical service. It's not, no company's going to fail because they can't access their, their Amazon, uh, th their movie. Like <laughs> that's just not yeah. how it works. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. You're, you're, you're right on. But we would see, we would see in um, like EMR companies where they were moving unbelievable medical records, data, payload, uh, like scientific research. And then it's a different ball game. Well, yeah. Yeah, financial, right? Financial data, financial information, factory floors, right? That come to a halt because of something that was running in the cloud. I mean, so there's impact all over the place, you know, when you look at it. So it's important for organizations to have a blend. And we speak to that across the globe. You know, right before we started this conversation, I had made a comment about how, you know, my producer, myself, Aaron, and I were talking about, you know, today there's a lot of service providers. They don't have enough access to skill to lay, to employees to lay, um we were naming services like electricians plumbers mm -hmm. and so forth do you see that in the hardware game because this is a question that i'm curious about because if 
people will always talk like they don't want more hardware. Like they're not going to invest in hardware. Like that's if you read a if you read like a you know like a maybe like a Y Combinator like tech blog kind of deal, right? Yeah. Are you seeing that on the on the labor front as well? Do you see less people being because you mentioned you're servicing a tremendous book of business for hardware? Do you have trouble getting those people? Are those like those are those skills in less supply nowadays? What are you seeing in regards to how labor markets are going? Yeah, I think it's a combination. You see that a lot of folks are now driven away from that skill set yeah. because they believe, right, that it's the higher paying job is not within the hardware you know, infrastructure space. But we also see a lot of folks that are getting their, you know, cutting their teeth, right, in that start within an organization or a company. And they're able to build and grow within that, that company. So it's available, right? It's out there. I mean, this ties to ITSM right? And all of those tools that are out there, hardware is still one of the key factors. If you, if you look at a, you know, a company that has 100,000 employees and they're those employees that you know, work behind the machine, right? Well, that's 100,000 devices, right? That have to be there and supported. And what goes behind that? It, it's a whole dichotomy of, oh, the PC is dead, right? And I've always fought that for years and years. And I'm like, the PC is probably the most important tool that a company has because it's view into everything that's happening within their organization. You can have the best servers and the best infrastructure and the best solutions, but if you don't have a view into it, a portal in, which is a PC, and then that PC does the right job, well, then what are you doing, right? So it's, uh, the PC will never be dead. It may change and morph, right? It's an iPad and then it's a tablet and then it's this, but it's a keyboard, a mouse, right? And a screen, and that's never gonna go away. No, but the uh, the challenges surrounding it are actually going to get more complicated because there's now BYOD companies, yep. right? You roll your eyes. I want to get <laughs> yeah, yeah. BYOD is is bad. Bad. It needs to be bad. You only die. You know. <laughs> I want to dive into that. Let's get let's go right into it because that's one of the things that's more. It's something that companies now have to debate, like, do they, what kind of policy do they have when it comes to equipment? Do they provide you a stipend where you can buy a computer and work here? Do they provide you a computer and, of course, have it connected to their infrastructure systems? Or do they let you just bring your own? Yeah. So BYOD, for those listening and not familiar, but I'm sure everyone's familiar, bring your own device. It is a corporate policy where you can say, hey, I'm not going to issue you a computer. I'll let you bring whatever you want and plug into all my data and systems. Bob here is saying it's bad news. Let's dive in. <laughs> I mean, I inherently, I can see plenty of gaps when doing this, but I'd love to hear from your perspective. Yeah, it, it's, it's very simple, right? There's, there's versions of BYOD, right, that you have to look at. So the, the traditional mindset of bring your own device, give you a stipend, go to Best Buy, go to Amazon, right? Buy any device that's going to do the compute, right, is a disaster waiting to happen, right? Because people... They look at the wrong dollar amount. They look at the cost of that unit, yeah. right? Or that PC and what they can save, right? And, but they're not looking about, at all of the risk associated with bring your own device. And I'll delve into that a little bit more, but more so forget the risk. Let's talk about the productivity, right? So I issue you a device, right? It's a corporate standard. We have it locked down. We have the security. It meets all our specs. It's going to run the applications that you need. That's all good. You're a productive worker. Why? Because I've tested as a corporation that you are productive on this particular platform and device. Now we're going to shift over. Another group has BYOD. So you decide, right, that you're going to run to Best Buy and you buy the $399 machine, right? Because <laughs> I'm going to pocket some cash. <laughs> pop, yeah, or whatever the case may be, or it's a, it's a nice and shiny with a touch screen and all that, right? And those machines are built at a different class than the corporate standards, right? And all of the OEMs, the HPs, the Dells, the Lenovo's, they'll tell you that, right? That consumer model is not built to the rigid standards of the corporate model. And that's the internals, the security chips, where they're sourcing the equipment, a bunch of that stuff. But now I'm paying you, say $125,000 a year. And then you're producing work that generates, say, a half a million dollars a year for me, okay? Now you're on your BYOD device, that device goes down. Now it's cheap. It was cheap for me as the company, right? It only cost me 300 bucks for you guys to go out and do it. I gave you a stipend. It's awesome. Now you call your geek squad right, at Best Buy and they say, oh, you have to bring it in. 
You bring it in, you sit there, you wait at the desk, you go to the desk and or, hey, the board's bad. We got to send it out. We got to do this. Okay. It's four days, right? So now it's going to be four days for you of downtime, right? Now I'm still paying you, right? Because you're on BYOD and that device is not working, I still have to pay you, right? You don't walk away and I don't push you away and you say, um, yeah, you don't have to pay me while my machine is being fixed, even though I picked that model. More uh, so the guy on the corporate side, he's got a loaner system. It's the standard. It's got a four hour response time, right? All of those things that tie to productivity. So what, what folks don't look at and think about a lot of times, and I talk to some of the biggest corporations in the world on this, and they get that aha moment, right? Because you, you have the folks that are so cost conscious that PCs are so expensive. Yeah. They don't take a look at the bigger piece of it, right? Which is the productivity curve that's lost based on going to a BYOD device. Now, there's a way to go about that and creating a BYOD that says, these are the standards that you can pick from. Okay. And giving choice. So you've got an Apple device, you've got a PC device, right? Different OEMs. And now you have your choice of flavor and you can do that in a stipend, but it's managed, it's controlled. It's got all the security attributes on it and it's not going to affect you with productivity. You know, so BYOD is definitely a, a risky scenario for large corporations, right? That need to have function and, and not have downtime. You know, I'm curious, you know, one of the things, because we're seeing, obviously, you right now, where the position that Future Tech Enterprise is in, is you have all these companies that are fundamentally having to change how they're going to provide the tools for workers right now with work, remote, hybrid, it doesn't matter. Things are changing super fast right now due to the pandemic and the availability of these jobs like this. So you're helping them with their, you know, machine policy. Talk a little bit about like security policies that are also you're starting to see, because this got brought up with one of our other guests that talked about, you know, you could have the world's best identity management systems, let's say like financial services. Let's say I work for you, Bob. We do financial transactions into like, uh, you know, high net worth individuals. I got a secured machine. I got secured everything. And he brought up the point that, well, you don't, you actually don't have identity access management at a remote location because if I get up from my computer and my roommate has been convicted of wire fraud <laughs> and I go to use the bathroom and he sits down at my machine, there is absolutely nothing stopping him from doing whatever he wants to do or on the computer. Yeah. Talk about like this new rise of what are some of the challenges I guess you're seeing now with companies that maybe weren't used to it before, or maybe they were used to it. They just don't realize how many gaps they're opening up in their process when they have to accommodate for hybrid work models. Yeah, I think a lot of organizations had a, call it a minimal at home, right, scenario for some of their workers and for their remote workers, right, because folks traveled all the time and they had controls as much as they could on there. But to the level that this pandemic made everybody go, right, at home immediately created tons of risk around how you're going to support, you know, traditional hoteling right, that was out there and remote workers and remote security, it changed the dynamic tremendously, right? Now, to your point, those are physical kind of hacks that we would call, right, versus technology hacks or cybersecurity hacks. There's another one that a lot of folks didn't think about, and now they do, which is called visual hacking, right? So you're on a plane, right? I'm the seat behind you. You're working on, you know, your IPO that's going to launch tomorrow, right? And, and someone's across from you, they can see your screen, right? And they're on their thing and they say, hey, Tommy, you know, tomorrow they're going IPO. And I think this is a number, right? And, and now that gets out there and it, and it causes all kinds of risk. So the OEM saw that as a gap, right? The HPs, the Lenovo's, the Dell's, and they created, I don't know if you've seen this yet, these screen inherent technology in the machine to hit a button so that someone can't look over your shoulder. It wipes out the screen. Oh, I've seen the, um, I've seen like covers for it. You know, like they used to be able to put like a cover on it. You're saying it's built into the machine. Yeah, you're right. Right. So because visual hacking is hundred percent effective. <laughs> if I can see your screen, I'm hundred percent effective on it. And that's the same thing for somebody at their home, right? If somebody's looking over your shoulder, and they can see what the things are, then they're at risk. Now that goes beyond the identity theft. But 
there are tools and technologies that are coming to bear. And look, the pandemic has created this whole group of quick release organizations that have software fix, hardware fixes for security things that are being done at home. So i.e., if I move away now based on a camera, there's some software, right? When I move away from my screen based on the camera, it immediately locks the machine, hmm. okay? So that protects your roommate who wants to go in and, you know, <laughs> do wire fraud, right? I don't actually have a roommate that does wire fraud, by the way, yeah. but he was a hypothetical. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very yeah. good one. No, no, I, I had two of them in college, right? <laughs> so, uh, but as you look at it, right, those are, those are things that are going to, the gaps are going to come. People are going to see the gaps and then they're going to do things to fix the gaps, right? So identity management is obviously key and identity security and controls that are there. But then, you know, AI is going to play a whole part of this, right? If you saw Jensen's keynote, right, and talking about how they're going to be using AI to predictively look at security threats and cyber risk, it's going to stop it before it actually happens, right? So there's a lot of this stuff that's going to happen quickly now that's going to protect the remote user because it's not going away, right? Corporations has real, have realized, man, I can save a whole lot of coin by not having physical real estate, Oh yeah, right? And having people work at home and I don't have to give them a stipend, right? It's like the second biggest expense line, I believe, for most companies, if not the first. <laughs> well, yeah. Payroll's usually number one, but- Payroll's one, right? That's two. IT's three, actually. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what you're seeing today in regards to like what let's say prospects, clients, customers, what are they talking about that they're most concerned about? Because, you know, one of the things that you have a unique position of is your, your company offers such a wide array of services. Where are they feeling the most, I guess, gaps? Is it cybersecurity? Uh, because, you know, we were just talking about recently, you know, obviously the Colonial Pipeline hack, yeah. it affects us, you know, Aaron's down in Florida, I'm here in North Carolina, it affected us big time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, is, is cybersecurity the biggest concern these companies have? Is it managing remote work? Is it talent retention? Where are you seeing people be calling you most? Like, Bob, I, I need help. I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> On those three topics is yes, yes, and yes, right? <laughs> because that's, that's really what's happening right now, right? There's a whole conversation, and this ties to, you know, something that we talk to, which is digital transformation, yeah. right? Because digital transformation is that thing like cloud. Well, what does that really mean? Right. Because what it means to Gina is different than it would mean to Tommy and what it means, you know, this guy. Digital transformation is the same. Right. Digital transformation is OK. You know, you're going to hear digital transformation. You hear industry 4.0, platform of platforms. Right. All of these things. And, and they all roll up into, you know, transforming your organization based on technology to the future needs of the workers. Right. And what we're doing and what we're seeing from our customer side is. Every one of them are standing up digital transformation offices, every one of them. And they're hiring guys and girls, right, that are digital transformation officers. And actually, CIOs are reporting now to that office, right, to the uh, CDO, yeah. right, chief digital officer, right? It's a new one, right, that's out there. That popped up, right, another, another C. And these guys are reporting up there. And really, that whole thing, it, it ties to an ecosystem of technology requirements and offerings, right? That are gonna be tied to security attributes, that, that ties to cyber, remote, right? So remote workers, remote workforce, it ties to infrastructure, infrastructure support, productivity as an organization, and talent retention and talent capture, right? All of those things, when we, when we speak on this, right? And, and again, we speak at some of the highest levels in organizations and give them recommendations from an outside perspective of what we feel that they should be looking at to attract and retain. Because that's a key start to this whole game, right? Because as you have an aging workforce in an organization, if you're not attracting new talent and attracting them in the way that they're used to now, then you're going to be on the backside, right? From a, a corporation's perspective. So we start there, right? With them, because that's in their head. They say digital transformation. Right. But again, what does that mean? So yeah. we start it, you know, it's talent. How are you attracting? Are you giving people choice? Right. How are you delivering that service? Are you giving them an, an old brick that they're like, what? <laughs> you know, how am I going to work with that? Are you giving them choice? Right. Are you giving them the things that they need? And then how, how do you then protect that? How do you build security around it? How, right. It's, it's a whole ecosystem that you look at. So there's no real right now, hey, everybody's worried about this right? It's, 
everybody's worried about this, 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 and this, right? Because those are all the key items for their infrastructure and their business moving forward, right? In the, call it, uh, industry 4.0, right? That we're going on. So Mission is a fully remote company, but two of our offices or our people, let's say, I'll just use my, we're in Austin and Raleigh, which are two of the hottest spots right now for attracting, uh, let's say, high skilled digital labor. One of the things that we're hearing about is the fact that there's so much power for the employee or the prospective employee. Like if I'm a top rated developer of whatever skill I have, my ability to call my shots is higher than ever. I got plenty of companies wanting me on their team and they're offering, to your point, different experiences, different, they're, they're trying to accommodate me into their world so that I will come to them because there's so much power. So is that like, you know, you kind of mentioned it, but I was hoping you could kind of, that CDO, what are they looking at? Are they looking at like how, because like you mentioned, it's not just that systems work, that's a given. It's almost like it's gotta be, to the interest of the worker, not at the expense of the customer. And that's what we do. Like, <laughs> you know, like I'm sure all their apps, I'm trying to imagine the buying process for a CDO right now. They're probably evaluating, like, let's say identity tools. And they're probably asking like, well, show me how many clicks that is. Show me how many, like, <laughs> how long does it take? But how are they doing it? I mean, you're hundred percent right. So what they're doing is, and they've also stood up, right? customer experience executives, yeah. right? So, so now, it's a, now you're not even a CDO, right? You're, uh, it's a, a CEO, but it's a customer experience, right? Yeah, C CXO, right? Customer experience, chief experience officer, but the, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. But it's an X instead of an E, right? But that becomes a very important part of it, right? Even to the point of onboarding, right? What was my onboarding experience? You know, do I have all of the things in the systems that I need day one that I'm going to start? Because we've seen companies that have walked away or uh, employees. We had uh, an employee who started for another company and his PC wasn't ready day one. He didn't come back day two. What? It was a six-figure job. <laughs> he walked away. And he's like, look, if they can't, you know, if they can't give me a machine, is this the view of what I'm going to have moving forward? Right? So there's a lot of these things, but the power has shifted, right? It has changed. It's the potential employee's power right over the corporation that used to say, you know, we've even seen people come in to interviews in, you know, not a college shirt, right? And, and be like, well, this is me. This is who I am, right? It, it's a different change. It's a different shift. And organizations have to figure out how to handle that support so they can retain and attract the traffic. Even, you know, the word sexy is used a lot, right? I need to have stuff that's sexy, my tools, my technology, right? How I can click, and to your point, right? Is it one click? Is it five clicks? You know, what is my experience um, that I'm going to get? And that's where we try to teach on, you know, the digital transformation is what are you guys doing with augmented reality, right? Virtual reality, right? All of these other components that people are used to in their personal side, right? And you want to drive that now into their business side. So it's uh, the next five years are going to be really interesting. But, you know, you brought up what's that chief digital officer looking at? He's not looking at the tools. He's looking at the result, right? And the result of what needs to be for the next three to five years of that employee's experience and that employee's value back to the corporation. That's what they're looking at right now. The other stuff is air. <laughs> you know, the way you describe that, I remember back in 2000, so I was part of a software company in 2011 and we used, I would, I mean, it's pretty easy. We joke now. It was hideous. The, the product was hideous. And we were a startup. And I remember we had arguments. Some of our customers had arguments with the, our executive team at the time. Like, hey, this is not going to work simply because it's just too ugly. The executive team was still behind the idea. Like, well, it functions great. And our, our customers like, we don't doubt that it functions great. But they brought up, they actually brought up that cost perspective you just did because it was a social media management software that had to be deployed to hourly workers around. So like, imagine your hotel chain, you have a thousand hotels. That means a thousand employees have to be trained on this. And they said, keeping the service manuals and training them is too hard. It's gotta be easier for them because you're costing us all this money. We're thinking, oh, it's, it's $10 a month. It's not, it's easy software. And they were like, so we saw it creeping in then, but now I feel like if it's hard to train on, it's probably a non-starter. Like you can't probably, like to get your tool inside of a company that's hard to train on, they're probably like, I'm not, I'm not even looking at it. Yeah, yeah. And the training needs to be visual, right? <laughs> there, there's no more, here's a manual, 
right? That stuff better be on YouTube <laughs> and, and video. And, and, you know, that's how, the, that's how people are learning now, yeah. right? And also they're, how they're multitasking better, right? Because the, the workforce is extremely different, right? They've been, you know, the new groups coming up, they've been trained on multitasking. You know, I have an 18-year-old, right, who will be my CTO eventually, right? We're grooming him for that. And, you know, he's got a, you know, Dean's List in college. And, and I, I see how he does his homework. And I'm like, it's impossible, right? He's got a screen. He's playing a game. He's got a chat on the other side. And then in the middle, he's doing work, right? And he's bouncing back and forth between, you know, each one of these things. But he's still, you know, a diesel. So I can't even bust his shoes and be like, focus on your work, right? It's, it's literally their minds are have been educated differently, right? Where they can do more. And, you know, you, we look at this in the aerospace and defense world where they are trying to attract the top gamers to come work for them because of their multitask skill capabilities, right? Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. A thousand percent, right? Because wars are not going to be fought on the battlefield with individuals, you know, down the line. It's going to be, I mean, look at the drones, look at all those things. I mean, that's going to be handled virtually. So it's a, it's an interesting scenario. It's a weird thing to think that your best video game player in the country could become your best pilot. You know, like you like the way you described it, yeah. like the the drone, right? Like, could that become the best pilot? Like they were where they would test people, but like, could you evade, you know, dog? Like, could you evade your drone in a dog fight? And like, I could see them simulating it, and this these kids are playing it, and like, who could get out of there alive? Yeah, their reaction times are like three times that of a standard pilot. I mean, it's, it's insane, you know, the stuff, but it's real, you know, it's legit because all of the systems on board, all the aircraft or the drones, it's all digital systems. Right. And it's literally like a game, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's a whole new world. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to, you know, dive into like, how does your team approach a problem with a customer? Because we kind of laid out like the landscape, but at the same time, you have your own team. So you have your own talent your team is aware of what technology and tools you have exposure to, of course. And of course you can learn anything you haven't had exposure to, but when a customer or when a client sits down with you for the first time, obviously you don't know what they have. They don't know what you know. What's your process for evaluating recommendations? Let's start there. Because if I have a tech stack that you're not familiar with, I mean, I guess the first step is you got to learn what that is, right? I don't know. How do you guys attack these problems? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You don't go into meetings or opportunities cold anymore, right? The data's out there, right? We have access to tools that tell us what infrastructure and or software systems that a customer has, you know, today. And if we don't know through those systems and tools, we have the ability to get it from the OEMs that we work with and partner there, right? So it's never where you just walk in the door. You know, we have, we have a philosophy here. No one is ever allowed to go in and talk about a customer's pain. If any of our reps go in and say, hey, what keeps you up at night? What's your pain, <laughs> right? You're done. You know, you're not allowed to work here, right? You can't, right? Because whoever wants to start a relationship off on pain, yeah. right? The first thing, you know, if you've got a black eye, you know, and I see you and I say, holy crap, you have a black eye. Does that hurt? Well, obviously you have a black eye. You know, you got a black eye. I'm sure it hurt. You know, when you did it. So why don't we talk about something a little bit different? So our goal is what we try to help. And when we go into a customer is, well, we want to understand their goals. What are they trying to accomplish? And I guarantee when you ask them what they're trying to accomplish, if there's pain that they have, that's going to come to the top of the plate. Right. right? And they're going to talk to you about, hey, here's what we're trying to do. Right. We even got rid of the word pain. The, our only word they can use is challenge. You know, what's the challenge? Because the challenge I can overcome, right, as an organization. So, you know, when we sit down and we sit down at a very high level and we try to understand, you know, what they're trying to accomplish, what are their goals, right? And then we say, hey, with all the stuff that we do and have done over the last 26 years and the tools and technology that are constantly being brought to Future Tech by its OEM partners, its software partners, right? We're on the bleeding edge of stuff, right? I had a company come to me, was it 15 years ago, maybe, maybe 20, said, hey, we've got this great product. We want to build data centers that are bulletproof, bomb, EMP, waterproof, hermetically sealed, Faraday cages, and they're completely independent of a building's architecture. So it's this panelized system that's four inches thick, right? And they're like, and we have no idea how to bring it to market. And at the time I thought, who the hell is gonna need something like this, right? But then we thought about what was missing in the market and some of the quote pain points that were out there. 
And we said, you know what? I think this maybe has some play. And we've helped this company be very successful. We have deployed that solution into major corporations to millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? Now, if you asked me, you know, two years before that, if I was going to be building data centers out of a panelized material, six-sided, right? I'd be like, are you, what? No, never, right? But opportunity came, the technology was there, we vetted it, we bring it out. And that's what our customers expect of us as well, especially when we're in an organization is to identify new things that are coming out. And that's why they bring us in to talk about digital transformation, because we're seeing that right on a day-to-day basis. And I've got a great teams of folks that that's all they do is live and breathe it, whether it's AI, data science, machine learning, right? All of that stuff. They know that stuff. And, and then we bring in those, those experts, right? To talk to them, to the customers. And then, you know, so like you mentioned these, the acronym a little bit earlier in our conversation, there's this whole new industry or it's not a whole new, I think it's a whole new name, ITSM. Yeah. IT service management. If I'm not mistaken, this has always been around, but now they just call it something different now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's cloud mainframe, right? Same thing, right? It's ITSM. Yeah. And what does it stand for? Information technology service management. Okay. So we've been doing that since day one. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't this just called managed services or IT outsourcing at one point? I don't know. Is it just an acronym name now? It was, but you also did it internally, right? You did it your, your own right? You had your own ITSM. What did that look like? Was it IBM Tivoli? Was it, you know, there were tons of different softwares going way, way back. It was an email ticketing system. You wrote to Bob, hey, Bob, this is broke, fix it. Help, (laughs) fix it, right? Or or Deck Pathworks. I mean, there was a ton of stuff, you know, that it's always been there. It's now becoming, you know, you'll hear the terms modern managed, right? Modern management. So autopilot, SCCM, right? All of these tools that are out there that, to help you manage your systems more efficiently and effectively, right? Now, with those technologies come holes. Yeah. With those holes come the need to patch holes. With them, create they create new companies, right? It's a whole bunch of crazy stuff that comes out of this when you start talking about you know all of these different types of modern technology solutions that you know come out there that are supposed to make our lives better that just make them a little bit more hectic. Yeah. From what I understand, the, the, the whole rise of ITSM software is like software for ITSM typically involves a couple feature sets, like case management, of course, is the given, but like they tell you that they can auto route, auto triage, a lot of auto, yeah. right? a lot yeah. of AI, yeah. machine learning based. And it's usually centered around that or some of them, I think, promise, like you said, like almost preemptive solutioning. So like some companies will say like, hey, my router's down, like you could I don't know, tell your ITSM to like rebump the router somehow, or like refresh the DNS on it. Yeah. And those, those solutions are there and they're getting better and better. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, Skynet's on its way. It's coming. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you subscribe to that? Like, have you seen these in play? Are, are they really that good at routing the right service ticket to the right people at the right time? Yeah. I, I would say, you know, it's that 80, 20 rule, right? 80% effective, 20%, you know, goes off into, you know, never, <laughs> never land. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we see that a lot, right? Because it, it takes a while for these systems to learn, right? And to know what it is. They're not going to be perfect. You know, it's like the auto driving feature, right? It only knows what it knows. Yeah. And you can give it billions of lines of code, but it only knows what it knows. So when something comes in from the side that's not there, you know, if it knows what a human looks like and all of a sudden there's an ostrich that looks like a cat and it walks in, it's going to probably run it over, right? So, you know, it, it's one of those things. What does it know? What can it do? How can it automate? What can it change? And it's going to get smarter and smarter, right? As time goes. But again, that's going to open up holes, yeah. security holes, risk, right? That has to be patched. And from your side, from your standpoint as a service provider, when companies say and ask you, hey, you know, you're going to be my service provider. I need a ticketing system. Do you guys typically recommend one or do you guys typically yep. just use whatever they are currently using? No, well, both. Right. So we'll make a recommendation. You know, it was a very large customer that needed help in migrating from Windows, believe it or not, seven to 10. Right. Is this recent? This was recent, believe it or not. This is the second example in the last two. We had another one call last week where someone was just upgrading from seven. And they were 20,000 seats behind. Jeez. Right. (laughs) So, and they had, they were doing it in a manual process, right? The sneaker net. And so we actually brought in Alteris. Right. We made a recommendation on Alteris and how we could stand up Alteris quickly 
We have our Alteris experts. We, we worked in and we stood that up. We actually still put 30 people on site, right, that we had to, but we got them across their goal line, right, what they needed to do, you know, before the support ended. But you see a lot of that, you know, that's out there. So we'll, we'll recommend or we'll utilize, you know, whether they want ServiceNow or SCCM or Autopilot, right? Doesn't matter. You know, we can support it all. Well, Bob, I want to thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. It was a lot of fun talking to you, hearing about the industry. And yeah, I agree. This is just another acronym they made up. This business has been forever. So you're, you're a revolutionary, man. You've been in ITSM for 26 years. That's amazing. Yeah. Yep. A lot of hair ago. So. <laughs> Bob, this is where we ask you questions outside of the world of work so our audience can get to know you better. The Lightning Round is brought to you by the Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Are you ready? I'm ready. If there is a world outside of work, but ready to go. <laughs> Let's find out. Listen, we looked at your Twitter and it says you're on your fourth Tesla. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. And I just ordered my new Plaid uh, Model X with the yoke steering wheel. Oh, that's like the super high-end one, right? That's the fast sucker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite feature of a Tesla car? Autopilot is a great feature, but the I'm a speed junkie. So uh, zero to 60 in nothing is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been in a Tesla when it's been floored. So for those who have not heard this, what is the experience like? It is, how do I say this? If you don't have your neck against your head against the back of it, you can really hurt yourself. <laughs> There's that much G-force that's being driven out of there. And it just, it grips and goes. Bob, what do you like to do? You mentioned kind of that life and work are blended for you. Yeah. <laughs> what do you like to do for fun outside of work? Um, you know, driving. I love driving and uh, I love traveling beach. You know, we, we have a, a place we like to go to at the beach. And, um, you know, outside of that, just being with the family. There you go. Family, fast cars, beach time. Hey, Bob, I feel like Future Tech is a great place to work then because if, this, <laughs> if that's what you're into, then that probably bleeds into your culture a little bit. I don't know, but it does. We, we got a good culture. We do. Bob, I want to thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing a little bit about your company. Thanks for showing us your love of fast cars, the beach. And for those of you guys who are interested in Future Tech Enterprise, singular. Singular. Very good. All right. Look them up on LinkedIn, the World Wide Web, or wherever you go to find companies and people. Take it easy, everyone. Take care, guys.